Um, I work at the Cambridge University HPC Systems Group. I'm talking on behalf of that group today. Our group is um, it's really tasked with delivering HPC resources for uh, faculties and research groups uh, from across the Cambridge University. And really that entails quite diverse use cases and, and very different requirements. But um, today I'd like to cover a little bit more about what we have been achieving in scientific compute and uh, with the help of OpenStack and our partners, not least uh, Canonical. In particular, I'd like to discuss our view of um, future areas for development and the forward direction that we would like to go with uh, Cambridge, Cambridge University and OpenStack. So what exactly are we doing with OpenStack and HPC at Cambridge? There are many uh, diverse use cases. And um, this, this photo here is uh, the Wilkes GPU cluster at Cambridge. It's designed to optimize the power, uh, compute power per joule of energy. When it first came out, it was uh, number two in the Green 500 uh, list of uh, the most uh, energy efficient supercomputers in the world. It was second only to a system here at Japan, in, uh, at Riken. Uh, this, uh, this system, the Wilkes system, is, uh, is now central to our OpenStack development plans. As part of those plans, I can, um, I can tell you that uh, for the first time ever, parts of the system are going to be running Ubuntu. So, uh, but there are many, many other use cases that, uh, that we must provide for as well. So let's just um, take a quick look at a couple of those. Uh, first and foremost, um, the square kilometer array is a radio telescope, but uh, more than that, it's also a vast IT infrastructure project that becomes increasingly bespoke and specialized, uh, demanding the closer you get to the radio dishes themselves. Further downstream, the use case becomes uh, more generic, uh, signal processing, data analytics, on the unprecedented amounts of data that uh, will be generated by the telescope each year. Groups within Cambridge are playing a prominent role in uh, the global consortium that is defining the architecture for sections of this hugely ambitious flagship project. Uh, my colleague Peter Brown will be up next, and uh, he's going to cover the SK telescope in a little bit more detail, so I will uh, move on now. The, um, our group, the uh, HPC Systems Group, is also closely involved in um, some biomedical informatics projects uh, with a, uh, a consortium of uh, the Cambridge University, um, local hospitals, and other bioinformatic research groups around the city. This is a project of three phases. So phase one was a pilot scheme to um, put a toe in the water with OpenStack, and the water was, uh, was found to be warm. Phase one has already been used very successfully by early adopters for research into the genetic causes of uh, uh, type 1 di diabetes, among other applications. Phase two is, is where we are now, and um, that really concentrates on adding HPC technologies into the mix. So for this project, we have selected an, a Mellanox network fabric and are exploiting the hardware offload, SRIOV, and RDMA capabilities of the Mellanox NIC. Uh, we're also working on HPC file systems and data access methods. Uh, this, uh, this system, the biomedical informatics system, is a canonical OpenStack system. It has a management plane of, um, which has been deployed using Maas and Juju. Uh, this is where we are today, and we've been working with our partners at Canonical on phases one and two. Phase three will be a production deployment of all the technologies that we've evaluated successfully in the other earlier phases. But what potential is there for doing scientific compute workloads in an OpenStack environment? Well. It turns out there's uh, quite a bit of interest in open, for OpenStack um, in science. OpenStack really enables for us the, the phenomenon of private cloud compute. So in scientific research, private cloud compute really unlocks the possibility of pooling resources between projects. It gives access to a greater shared resource on elastic demand uh, for the scientists. And one of the really telling statistics that I see here, I think this is just staggering, is uh, the, the survey from Vancouver of the OpenStack users who were attending. And they said that 41% of them were planning on deploying OpenStack for science and engineering workloads, which is just incredible. I mean, they were doing other things too, but uh, that, was, that was a real eye-opener for me. And so it really says that private cloud is a very successful model for science. Uh, for our group in Cambridge, private cloud washes away 100 small projects, small clusters, each born of an independent research project, probably not implemented perfectly. And these get replaced with a consistent and available managed resource, um, general purpose, but tailored to the requirements, specific science compute work workloads. 
more capable and more efficient due to the economies of scale and the expertise of the HPC cluster management group uh, specialists in my group. When scientists evaluate the cloud model, why stop with private cloud? And indeed, um, there are many science projects that are very successfully using public cloud services like AWS. You can also get specialist players in the public cloud space who are niche HPC operators. However, there are particular needs and requirements that the private cloud use case makes compelling. And um, partly that relates to the demands of high performance computing and the flexibility in OpenStack in being able to deliver on those demands. So let's take a look at some of those uh, requirements now. If we turn the comparison around and look at it from the HPC perspective, you can see that if you go to the supercomputing conference or something, 26% of the um, respondents surveyed there say that they are looking at cloud compute uh, for part of their high intensive um, analytics workloads. So it's an it's a, it's a intention that's getting reciprocated. It's mutual, really, between the two. Um, HPC itself is undeniably a big tent. There are various common themes, but there's no single unifying trait. But if you were to pick one, uh, you would say it is about whether HPC is a tightly coupled um, compute problem. CERN, for example, is an exception to that rule. You could without doubt say it's scientific compute, but their use case is strongly throughput dominated, a bit like cloud compute. In other areas of HPC, the theme is of tight coupling of instances. So um, sometimes we're talking about tight coupling of data with instances, and sometimes we're talking about tightly coupling of um, instances that are working together on a parallel workload. Uh, this is uh, typically what we call a bulk synchronous parallel model. Standard practice in cloud compute simply does not meet the requirements of this programming model today. Through our work with Canonical, uh, Mellanox, and uh, other partners, we've been working to address some of the requirements for tightly coupled compute on private cloud. Canonical have been working to enhance their support for uh, Mellanox InfiniBand NIX, and in particular the SRIOV and RDMA capabilities uh, that we so badly need. Uh, we'll shortly hear about Peter's team and their project on um, HPC stack. We've been working on, with Canonical on Juju charms for the deployment of and setup of scientific compute libraries and services uh, for Ubuntu instances on an Ubuntu OpenStack hosted environment. There is progress, and across the world there is a good deal of momentum, but from our research we still see gaps in the functionality. So stepping back and evaluating what is needed to plug those gaps, um, we really feel that we're still at the foothills of uh, where we need to be, not at the summit. So let's take a look at some of those gaps and where the future projects lie. Inevitably, the first has to be the question of whether you can have the benefits of private cloud infrastructure without paying any of the performance overheads. The established practices of OpenStack configuration are a well-traveled path now. Uh, perhaps you'd choose KVM for your hypervisors. You'd probably choose OpenVSwitch, VXLAN for your networks. And you'd probably choose Ceph for your storage. And you'd be in a very, very good company doing so. But recent studies have found that KVM is, is within 1% or 2% of bare metal performance when your workload is CPU or memory intensive. But when you include disk I.O. or network I.O., and those become a dominant part of your workload, studies have shown that the overhead can rise to as much as 40% of bare metal performance. With VXLAN network tunnels, the impact on uh, network performance can be so great that it means it's unlikely that you will achieve full bandwidth on any, of the any but the most basic of modern network fabrics. Uh, software vSwitches can dramatically increase the network latency and determinism of your uh, infra infrastructure. So what can we do about those things? Well, in each instance, we're seeking a better path to yield greater performance. Many people are working to study and address the overhead of virtualization. If you haven't seen the series of blog posts that CERN make, um, they made a good run over the summer on tuning KVM performance. I recommend checking those out. The CERN team point out that the overheads are not fundamental to virtualization. Um, in their comparison tests with Hyper-V, it soundly out outperformed KVM. So there are performance gains that can be had in KVM's implementation. If virtualization is not yielding, we've got other options. I mean, um, we've heard today about um, LexD, Canonical's um, OS level uh, containerized hypervisor. And um, these will give you close to the metal performance, but the real beauty is there's no material changes in the abstraction that you get when you're interacting with Nova. So um, that's something that we're going to be evaluating with interest at, uh, in our group at Cambridge. 
you go a little bit further for a little bit more gain, and um, you can create a sort of a bare metal platform with, uh, with OpenStack, and, um, and then manage that with an external container or orchestration system like a Mesos or Kubernetes. Um, for the HPC community, there's also uh, what's called the Shifter project, which came out of some of the US labs, which integrates a workload manager, Slurm in this case, with uh, dockerized workloads. Because we're in scientific compute, we have the luxury of a slightly more restricted context in what users want to do. And um, because of that, we can do some more specialized tricks. So with substantially more effort, we can make an even greater performance gain. Here's a couple of examples of the kind of stuff that's going on. So unikernels are an intriguing alternative strategy. It's an image that replaces the Linux kernel and the OS entirely with a single application a single address space, single process, static image, which takes the place of the Linux kernel so that it's running as though it was an operating system with no paging and nothing but the hypervisor between your application and the processor assigned to it. Intel's Exascale Research Initiative goes even further. They've recently published some work on a variant of this where it's, they, they call it a lightweight kernel where you just run two, two, one or two cores on for Linux in effectively a housekeeping role. The other cores in the system are entirely dedicated to running unikernel images. So there isn't even a hypervisor in this case. There's plenty of interesting work there, but um, much of it is scoped for a scientific OpenStack uh, private cloud. With regard to the network architecture, in some cases an HPC system is as much defined by its network architecture as it is by its processors. Network types that make use of software bridges can be a little bit of a problem, but they get a good bandwidth bounce when they're using Intel's DPDK toolkit at the expense of a CPU to core or two. Even with that, though, software vSwitches can add overhead. Cambridge is uh, deploying an alternative uh, strategy. We have um, on our Ubuntu OpenStack cloud, we're making use of Mellanox's hardware offload capabilities, SRIOV, and um, that, that gives us low latency, high bandwidth network punched straight through into the um, Nova instances directly. Many OpenStack, uh, si uh, sorry, sorry, many HPC systems also use a non-traditional network fabric. In the HPC space, InfiniBand is dominant, uh, but um, Intel are now positioning OPA, their uh, proprietary evolution. Even Ethernet in an HPC system has its own HPC-centric non-IP protocols. How does this fit into a cloud infrastructure where there are so many assumptions about layer three IP networking? Perhaps equally important is uh, how do we analyze the performance of a virtualized software defined infrastructure? In HPC, performance is vital, the clues in the name. We must, be, we must have the capability to monitor our HPC systems for performance issues in order to analyze, optimize, and repeat. How can we do this in an OpenStack system in which there are seemingly impenetrable barriers of abstraction that prevent knowledge of the physical hardware below percolating into the virtual world above. From an HPC viewpoint, a software-defined cloud has to be able to expose the details of its hardware-defined facts. A tunnel heat map is no use if it can only identify network tunnels that are underperforming without actually providing any clue as to why or what you can do about it. This is a challenge that's common to all large and complex high-performance compute systems. The key concept for a solution is to split the HPC workload into its layers of abstraction and gather data in each of the domains, the application-level knowledge at the top, the virtual network topology that it's working on next to that, and then the physical network infrastructure below that. Being able to correlate performance te telemetry data from one domain in the context of another is really the key to unlocking complex application performance issues. With this capability, for example, we can view the traffic from different workloads as they contend as they make their way across our underlying network fabric. We can view the interactions of communication with the converged storage traffic patterns, and that brings us to our next gap. Cloud file systems offer distributed, highly concurrent file I.O., but are really not so good at those instances where you have a single stream, high bandwidth, parallel file I.O. requirement. When used as a file system, Ceph stripes file data across its data servers, but it doesn't yet support zero-copy RDMA networking for transfers between server and client. 
high performance file access has for a long time been an expected requirement for an HPC use case. It's really table stakes. The dominant HPC file systems today, Lustre and GPFS, meet this requirement quite well. There was some discussion of Lustre at the Vancouver summit, and there is some progress going on in the community today. When approaching the question of Lustre integration, there are really two use cases that people envisage. Uh, the first one is really the Manila use case, where a Lustre volume is provisioned using OpenStack servers and storage for dynamically creating a Lustre volume or using those OpenStack resources. This volume is dedicated to a group of instances, dedicated to a single tenant, and operates as just a shared scratch space for temporary file data, and it then gets torn down. This, this Lustre integration in the Manila project is a work in progress today. Um, Glenn Bowden, I don't know if you saw his talk yesterday from HP, he spoke about this and he touched on this use case. Secondly, the use case in which an external production Lustre file system, a site file system, must be mounted inside an OpenStack cloud uh, by the compute instances. This file system will come packed with petabytes of data. We don't want to be copying it around too much. We need efficient, high bandwidth parallel file I.O. to this external volume, which is likely to present challenges for any neutron gateway that's caught in between. Uh, the exciting news for Ceph is that an RDMA solution is coming along, built, along the, built on the Axelio library. I understand it's well advanced, and we're looking forward to um, uh, following that with interest. Finally, I think this one is the big one. Even if you're not trying to be too smart about it, OpenStack has a very high bar to entry. It is the mother of all learning curves. Scientific research institutions have a good deal of expertise, but they do not typically have the skill set in-house that's necessary for OpenStack administration and operation. There isn't an established forum for sharing experiences, know-how, and support. OpenStack maintains a mailing list for HPC, but its volume of traffic is so low, it was folded in as a subtopic of operators uh, mailing list instead. At Cambridge University, the HPC Systems Group wants to be a part of reinforcing and reinvigorating that community. We want to con contribute what we find on our identified gaps, and we want to work with others across the scientific community to build a common strategy for optimizing OpenStack for these scientific compute requirements. We're going to be looking for scientific institutions, companies, and OpenStack vendors like our partners who have leadership in this field and who have also been interested in participating in the scientific OpenStack forum. We'll be looking to support others who are making the same journey as Cambridge's, and we're aiming to build a critical mass in an ecosystem that supports a scientific OpenStack. Thank you. So as Stig's saying, um, Cambridge has been instrumental in looking at gaps using HPC and OpenStack together in a real-world production environment. They're looking at things that we know are HPC challenges, assembling their large Lustre cluster into their OpenStack, looking at low latency, high performance interconnects. Peter Brown has been also cooperating with us from Cambridge on actual practical work to address some of those gaps. And I'd, I'll leave him to introduce himself because he bears no introduction himself. But um, he'll talk about what practical work we've been doing together and how far we've gotten. <laughs> Cables. Very good. Perfect. Uh, thank you. So I, I'd like to uh, tell you about uh, an effort that is uh, f quite, quite closely related to that of STIG, but it has a, a different focus, different goals, uh, and, and a different time trajectory. So uh, I work primarily for the um, Square Kilometer Array group in Cambridge. The Square Kilometer Array is a, a huge new radio telescope that's being built. It will have uh, on the order of a million antennas, and they will be spread over two continents. Uh, there will be one installation in South Africa, 
and uh, another one in, um, in Australia. And uh, one of the first questions you always get is, why do you go to these countries? So first of all, there is much more to see on the southern hemisphere. It points at the center of the galaxy, for example, and so you don't want to be on the north side. Uh, but very, very interesting is you don't want any humans around because cell phones and radio telescopes don't go together. So the, the population density, particularly in Australia, is stunningly low. It's 0 0.05 humans per square kilometer. Yeah? And so that's the kind of place where it's good to build a radio telescope, not very good to build a supercomputer. Yeah, because the supercomputer needs a lot of power, and so we have uh, enormous uh, wide area network uh, problems. And uh, here, here's a picture of this whole, uh, whole data path. So you, you see these little antennas on the left. Uh, this is a new kind of replacement of the dishes of the past, where electronics will um, replace the careful uh, parabolic shape that was present in the past. Um, th this kind of family of antennas will produce uh, 20 exabytes a day. Yeah, um, 20 exabytes is a little bit much for a computer to digest, so this first goes into electronics. Uh, this, this subsystem is called uh, cent uh, uh, how is this called? Uh, a central signal processing. I find that a very strange word because it isn't so central. It's almost at the beginning of the, it uh, should be called digital uh, signal processing maybe. So that does a big reduction of the data in some way, but it also um, works for every pair of telescopes. And so because we have so many pairs, it also increases the data very much. And um, the, this electronic stuff is in the desert, relatively close to the antennas, except that the antennas themselves span hundreds of miles. Then we need to go to cities where there is enough power. So we go to uh, Cape Town and Perth, where enormous supercomputers will be built to change these pre-processed signals into images. Yeah, images and some other scientific data like rotating pulsar data and that sort of thing. That's not the end of the traveling data. Uh, a single image uh, that is created by these supercomputers is going to be about 100 terabytes in size. So that's a little bit more than what you get on your iPhone at the moment. Yeah? And uh, then that needs to go to probably dozens to hundreds of tier one data centers across the world. Um, how many compute systems have I now covered? Quite a lot. Yeah, these are going to be enormous computers. I'll tell you uh, the, the, in a minute, I think, how big they really are. But uh, th there are these central computers and then these computers worldwide. So the question that we encountered was really, um, what are the facts around this deployment? Yeah, be because this is, this can't fail. This is a big system on which uh, a lot of money is being spent. So first of all, the first deployment is still a long way out. Yeah, it's around 2020 or something like that. It may be upgraded before the thing goes in full production around 2022. Secondly, we have this federation across all these centers around the world that will be doing data analytics for the scientists. Um, to make things even worse, we have opinions. Every year we have a different opinion about what the right hardware solution might be and what the right software solution might be. So many, many things are undecided. So we put our heads together, and we means, in this case, uh, Cambridge, uh, meaning the astronomy group there, and uh, the high performance compute services, together with Canonical, and uh, the Center for High Performance Computing in South Africa, which is a, a major player in this. And so we had some discussions, you know, what, what do we really need? How can we get there? Uh, we need a little bit of money to develop a prototype. Yeah, and um, we concluded relatively quickly that OpenStack with a few HPC enhancements is the way to go. And I'm going to tell you um, how, how this is progressing because it, it, it's looking promising. Of course, at the same time, what Stig described was happening in the compute services, yeah, that is focused on things that are happening sooner, but that are much more ambitious in some ways. Yeah, they, they want to solve the general problem of HPC. We only have uh, you know, a somewhat limited focus for our applications. 
So, so what is SKA actually computing? Uh, images of the sky. Yeah, now that, that may sound uh, boring, but it's actually quite complicated because there are lots of effects from clouds and sunshine and all, all kinds of trouble, calibration effects they're called. And uh, we, we are looking for very, very faint signals from very early in the universe, very small objects, very weak signals. And so there's a, a very refined algorithm needed, uh, but only a few algorithms. Yeah, it's, it's a, a, a set of four or five programs probably that will be running. So the computers that were designed for this um, are not going to be the biggest computers in the world at that time, but they will have some very special qualities, namely they will be very data intensive. So typically the I.O. ratios that we see will be uh, much higher than, uh, than in, in supercomputing installations. And this is related to the sensor nature of this problem. Yes, sensors create masses of data, lots of noise in it, and uh, as a result, there's more churn of data and maybe somewhat less computing. So you see the budgets here, the power. Yeah, um, there, one of the things that's very, very interesting, the ingest of the data is going to go into 100 petabytes of very, very fast storage, yeah? And that needs to be read then 10 times every six hours or something like that. So here's a picture of the, of the data flow going through that system, yeah? So we start with, with input data on the order of, of five to 20 terabytes per second. That's something that, you know, a future file system can maybe keep up with. Then we do image reconstruction, which is a lot of computation and we read that data 10 times again. This is very unusual in HPC. HPC applications normally only write, but in data analytics applications, as you find them in the cloud, this is quite common. Yeah, they analyze and analyze again. So here you, you start to begin to see what is sometimes called high-performance data analytics, yeah, where these two uh, disciplines converge. The output is not a big problem for us. It's only an exabyte of data, and uh, that's a five-year archive. It doesn't have to be written very fast, but you know, an exabyte is going to be one of the bigger file systems in the world yeah, at that point in time. Um, the science I already talked about, distributing this to 100 places is a problem in itself, yeah, but it's probably not much worse than YouTube. It might even be much less than YouTube, yeah, but we are also less cash rich than uh, Google is. So this brings you to the question, what's really different between SKA and maybe some other future HPC projects? We have both computation analytics, yeah, we have um, very advanced software because we are thinking about a new application that's years out. So we, MPI is a choice for us. It's a standard for most other people. Yeah, we look at very modern data flow packages, uh, very advanced compilers to deal with multiple optimizations and, and other architectures and that sort of thing. Um, it's highly specialized, yeah, only a few applications. So it's a different sort of system. Traditional HPC runs many programs in the, in the data centers, so they have to be very, very flexible. They're more focused at the moment on simulation, although that is changing, yeah? Uh, the, so the, the, the trend is towards more analytics and somewhat less simulation. And uh, at the moment, there is typically one evolving large image with system libraries. It's always out of date. Yeah, and so we, we believe that that led us to what we've called HPC stack. Um, I, I think it was Kiko's idea to, um, to, to use this name. And uh, we, we wanted to make it as simple as possible. And so we said, let's look what Canonical has built. And so we use MAS for the uh, deployment of the bare metal hardware. MAS is capable of handling many architectures, which is very important for us because we don't know what architecture we will be using. That's one thing. But also this telescope will become 50 years old or something like that in its lifetime. A telescope is not something you throw away like a laptop after a year or something. Yeah, it, uh, so it, it's going to go through generations of hardware. Provisioning, do uh, you with the charms? Yeah, it looks really good because we can add HPC software to this and uh, things like uh, MPI packages, InfiniBand, Dataflow software, and container models 
will be very, very nice for us to use. Yet people can build their own development environment, do some testing on small systems, and migrate that very easy to a large HPC cluster. They're no longer tied to this fixed image on these, 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 uh, that is available at the compute centers. Yet yeah? people can use their own environments using a container model. So we want to leverage OpenStack, particularly for monitoring and authentication and identity management. This is very important in these uh, federated situations because they typically have uh, distributed uh, user databases yeah, that are not identical in every place and their interaction is tricky, still being worked out to some degree. Um, also, OpenStack allows many different storage systems to be integrated and uh, you know, we, we're thinking about uh, both the current systems and the future systems. Evolution is very important. Ubuntu and OpenStack will stick around. So the philosophy is to get to working prototype fast. Yeah, we um, we, we we think that we don't want to wait years and years. We want an effort that is manageable. Even if only SKA will use HPC stack, we want to get there in a few months and be happy that we have something that's usable, that maybe can be supported by Canonical or that we can handle ourselves. We don't want a project that is too large for our needs, but we want to do it in a way that would enable a large following. Yeah? So we've made the choices very careful carefully so that if people think this is a good idea to do HPC in general, for example, by integrating maybe many of the patches from the uh, HPCS effort that Stick talked about, they can. So what's the status at the moment? Um, the status is that uh, we've worked on implementing this for a month and we actually got further than I thought we would. Yeah, so at the moment we can uh, deploy and run MPI programs on, on clusters. Um, we have built a few charms for Slurm and OpenMPI. Uh, we've made fixes to the Keystone database to deal with user IDs and groups, which are not needed in cloud software, but uh, on which much of the HPC software depends. Yeah. Now, the next goals are to leverage the fast networking efforts that we just heard about, uh, Docker containers, some more storage systems, and then the SKA prototypes that are being developed need to start running. Yeah, and, and the goal is that maybe in another two or three months we would have this done. Um, and then we will make a little bit of noise about this project. Yeah, we can say, okay, in four months, this is how far we got. You have something that goes end to end, yeah, from hardware deployment to fairly advanced applications. Maybe this is a good model to follow. Yeah, uh, it's a wait and see situation, but I think it is reasonably promising. I think this is almost all I want to tell you. Please use it, Con contribute to it. Yeah, it's done with uh, the package, package uh, system from uh, Ubuntu that allows you to adapt to Ubuntu very easily to something new and roll it back. Yeah, so everybody can contribute without much effort. Uh, you can also just follow it and uh, take another look from time to time to see where we're getting. Thank you very much. Very much. Yep. Uh, we have a few minutes for questions. If we'd like some, the audience actually grew pretty much since we started here. So I wanted to take a step back and, act, and ask, um, are others that are considering OpenStack for HPC workloads interested? And would you like to ask questions and know a bit more about what we're doing? I, I have a set of questions as well, but I'll let you guys go first. Yeah, sure, please. Infrastructure that involves a lot of degrees of freedom. And how can you optimize something with so many variables? 
I think it's a, that's a very good question. So um, one of the curious problems is that we want to create the illusion of a virtualized infrastructure. But you also really need to, um, you don't want to lose any of the benefits of knowing the physical placements of things. And, um, and that can be a problem. But I think with um, a lot of the, um, the sort of periphery projects that are going on in OpenStack for enabling better access to the hardware and so on, you, you can actually um, recreate equivalent performance um, you, as you would for a, um, a bare metal system that you hand create yourself. And you get, um, I mean, I think in the best outcome is that you don't sacrifice anything, but you gain a lot of the support of things like um, uh, the multi-tenant access, but you also get to use um, the repository of images so that um, there is no supercomputer out there where you can choose what image you want to boot. And, um, and that, that is a great strength that is brought by the flexibility of the sort of software-defined cloud, cloud infra infrastructure. So could, could I uh, uh, supplement your answer with a few other things? So, so when you take a supercomputing application, typically you follow three steps. First, it's written. Yeah, you have to build it. Uh, you maybe test it on one node or something like that. Then you get a small, ta small cluster test case. Yeah, they give you a few nodes to see if it works. And then you go to a big cluster. Now, with containers, this transition becomes a lot smoother. First, while you're developing it, you can put together what you want. Yeah, then you can take that same container to your small cluster and to your big cluster. It doesn't really change the situation of scaling. Yeah. But that problem you have anyway. Yeah, so it, it won't change the network topology uh, problem that you have. It's totally true that a tightly coupled application is very dependent on the topology. It is now, and it will be with OpenStack deployed cluster. That doesn't change. Yeah, it's the development cycle that changes your interaction with the system administration, your ability to use new software. Yeah, so what you're saying is not everything changes. And that's completely true, yeah? But some parts do change in a favorable way. Fair enough, or, yeah? <laughs> sure. So, um, so um, I don't know how are you planning to uh, manage the operative system in the nodes, but is the idea to create like a camera operative systems that you create for each job and then you Yes, that's what container systems do. You basically, instead of scheduling a program, you schedule an entire environment in which your system runs. It's smaller than a whole virtual machine, yeah, but it's bigger than the program. So that what? Uh, How can you make sure that, for example, nobody is uh, mining bitcoins, but that, because the nodes are going away? Uh, I, uh, I I think you can't be totally uh, certain of that, but but you you can't be at the moment either. People can obfuscate programs extremely easily, yeah, and so that so. Well, with, you still with, um, can. The tra the yeah. network traffic remains transparent. With cloud infrastructure, you do have. Um, a lot of opportunities to make some quite sophisticated log analysis. Um, you get to bring it all to one place, and you can you can yeah. process it in in yeah. different and better ways than yeah. usual yeah. HPC systems yeah. too. So. what to do with that data which is generated. By the way, isn't mining bitcoins one of the best things that HPC centers can do um, to pay for their Especially expenses? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> yes, absolutely. With spare, with spare capacity, when, when the clusters yeah. are not all busy, it's definitely the case. Mm. Actually, that's a, that's a good question I wanted to ask. Um, how do we see exposing additional hardware acceleration into the system? So one thing which is nice in HPC systems today is because you're running on bare metal, you've got GPUs there, you have other additional yeah. accelerators, you can just write your program and use them. 
So there's a very interesting example of that, which is the, um, the Chinese computer, Tianyu 2. Tianyu yeah. has Runs Ubuntu. Xeon Vice. Runs Ubuntu. Yes, and I'm not sure how they manage it, but um, the, uh, I think the way the strategy for doing that is exporting the uh, capabilities as Nova Flavor attributes. So, um, I mean, it's, uh, yeah, I think that there is work to be done there around yeah. exposing those capabilities in a way which the generic <coughs> container aware application can leverage. Yes, I, I think by the way, there will also be some obstacles um, here. So, so for example, you could expose a, a GPU relatively easy to a, to a single uh, application, yeah, yeah, that runs within one container or, or something tightly coordinated. You can't probably expose it to a random number of containers. But at the moment, nobody's really doing that either. Right. Yeah? So if you run a GPU job, you probably get that whole GPU uh, as part of your resource allocation by the scheduler. Yeah, that's, uh, that, that is actually, I think, the point Stig's making, yeah. that the scheduler needs to understand, OK, yep. I need to make sure that it is an exclusive job on that node, because otherwise. Yep. It, but it, so the HPC schedulers already understand these things very well. Yeah, so Slurm has ex extremely good management of what resources on a particular machine you, you get and how exclusive they are. Yeah. And the MAS attributes can bleed through into Slurm, I guess, is one question. Will it know, will it be able to inspect from MAS what the node has available? Yes. Yes, that, uh, uh, and uh, probably the easiest way to do that is to actually let Slurm uh, schedule the, the containers and not run inside a container. I see. Yeah, I see. so that it, it has a good knowledge of the machine. Right, right. Any other questions from the audience? We, um, I can speak from my experience that we were running them inside a um, network namespace, so effectively inside the networking proportion of a container. And um, what I found from that was um, the performance is more or less equivalent. So there were, there were some knotty problems to do with the uh, discovery processes because if you use a container and you isolate it from the, um, uh, the control plane of, of OpenStack, you're probably also severing a connection back to the uh, Slurm controller daemons. And, um, and it needs to use that to find the jobs and do job startups. So there's a discovery phase, which um, in the last investigation I did was not working very well. But um, actually, the, if the performance on itself was, was pretty good. That was on a, um, a 40 gig Ethernet. Um, no, I don't think it was to do with memory performance. So no, I, no, I don't just, think with a container yeah, you would see any any visible impact of it, memory It's just sort of network visibility inside containers that mm. we encountered, and and by by opening uh, some visibility on networks, the, the jobs ran normally uh, across a number of containers. Actually, it was remarkably easy. Yeah, there was nothing special going on uh, in the end. Yeah. All right, well, thanks very much for attending. Thanks very much, Stig and Peter. Thanks. Very good.